Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, hello, I'm Gareth, and I want to talk about reasoning about client-side web programs. Okay, so the, the stuff I'm gonna, be to, I'm gonna talk about, it's a part of a larger project, and the larger project is called JSCERT. And JSCERT, you know, it's a collaboration between some of us at Imperial and some people at, um, at INRIA REND. Uh, I'm just gonna kill my screensaver. There we go. Um, and I'm going to say more about the big project later. Uh, these are the people who did the work that I'm going to mostly be focusing on just in this talk. All right? So what I want to do is verify client-side web programs. What's a client-side web program? It's some JavaScript and some DOM. All right? So uh, a lot of you said that you had written at least some JavaScript, so you know what that is. Uh, it's a programming language. It lives in all of the web browsers. It's the only programming language I know of that you can rely upon to exist in any web browser that you're ever likely to, to make use of, with the possible exception of things that require plugins like Java and Flash, but then they have their own disadvantages. This is why JavaScript's important. Um, you know, it's everywhere. If you want to write a program on the web, you're going to have to, at the very least, compile it to JavaScript. Um, and it's showing up in other places as well. Uh, Windows 8 apps, you can write in JavaScript now. Uh, so they have access to, to stuff in your operating system. Um, uh, people like uh, Chrome OS and Firefox OS, uh, everything on there is JavaScript. Uh, if you want to use Linux, then uh, GNOME has JavaScript apps as well. Uh, on the other side of the, the screen, I'm, I'm also going to say a little bit about DOM. So DOM is the document object model, and that's the library that you use if you're writing a JavaScript program. Uh, I'm going to think of it as a UI library. What it really is, is a library specified by the W3C as a way of uh, manipulating XML trees. And when you're on the web, the XML tree you want to manipulate is the web page that your user is looking at. So it's going to act as your UI library. So in the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we reason about a JavaScript program, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about reasoning a DOM program, so I'm going to put it all together. OK. So if we want to think about JavaScript programs, I'm going to need to break some uncomfortable truths to you about JavaScript semantics. So that's where I'm starting. The first thing I need to tell you guys is JavaScript does not have variables. Um, what it has is uh, something like this. So you might be used in many sane programming languages to having a variable store, which you can think of as a stack. And every time you call a function, you add a new frame to the stack, and that's where your local variables are going to live. In JavaScript, instead of a stack, we're going to have, that's the wrong button, instead of a stack, we're going to have a list of pointers, and we're going to use objects on the heap to, in, instead of stack frames. Okay, so uh, I'm going to always put my local most thing on the left of my list and at the bottom of my screen, which is closest to the code. And the global most thing will be on the right of my list and at the top of the screen. Um, now, just a list of objects representing a stack, that would be quite comfortable. That would be fairly natural. But JavaScript is also a prototype-oriented programming language. Uh, how, who knows what prototype-oriented programming language means? Quite a lot of people, not everyone. I'm going to assume that you know what object-oriented programming is and inheritance. If you have um, a superclass, which you can determine statically, you're going to inherit behavior, variables, things like that from that. In JavaScript, a prototype is just like a superclass, except it's not static, it's dynamic. So it can change at runtime. So I'm going to write prototype pointers in red. So if I just... If I call the function, and the result of calling that function is a new stack frame, this new stack frame is not going to have a prototype, because it's just being a stack frame. 
But there's another way that I can add things to, to my variable store, and that's I can use the with command. If I do with and then uh, an object reference, I'll get something more like this. The object that I added on there might have, might have a prototype. So we had to get a whole prototype chain. So now uh, I'm confused. Well, what, what are the inputs and outputs to with? Uh, the inputs to with are an expression which will evaluate to a pointer and a object. Yes. Okay. And a block of code. And the result will be to run the block of code, but before you run it, put the pointer at the front of this list. Oh, you stack frame? Yeah. As it were. Yes. We're going to use an object as if it were a stack frame. Yeah? It's giving you access to all the fields. Yeah. And one of the effects of this is to give you access to all of the fields in that object. And then when we're done, we've run that block, we'll get rid of the pointer on the front of this frame that we put there. And we'll go back to where we were before. OK? So that's, that's what with is going to do. Um, sorry? Uh, when you say that, you mean the update to this thing. OK. It doesn't matter, because this is not something that the programmer can ever get access to. All of the stuff up here are things that the programmer can access. But this is just a part of the semantics of the language. Uh, in general, when you look at my slides, things that could be written in ASCII are things that the programmer might touch. And things that have bold or subscripts are things that I've added just to make it possible to narrate what's going on. Right? They're things that are just going to live in my logic or, or semantics. Okay? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you... Hmm? Right, that, I was hearing an echo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through just what happens when, when I run a couple of simple programs. I want to do x gets 5 on here. All right? So I'm going to look for x, see if I can find it. It's not there. It's not there, 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 or there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. I didn't find it anywhere. So I'm going to make up a new x, and I'm going to give it 5. So where should I put the new variable I'm going to create? Well, this is JavaScript. So by default, it goes in the global object. OK? Variables are global by default. So here's what just happened. I couldn't find x in any of these places. I followed all of these pointers in order to discover that I couldn't get x in any of those places. And when I was done, I put x up there. When you said you couldn't get x, each of these objects has a list of named fields. Yes. And those are what you're looking for. I'm looking for a field named x. In any of the objects that successfully. In any of those objects. And I couldn't find it in them. So, OK. Yes, in, in JavaScript, in, in JavaScript uh, an object can be thought of as a map from strings to values. Um, OK, so now I'm going to do y get 6. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look for y here, 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 and here. And now I've found it. So where should I put the y that I'm going to write? If I overwrite what's there, then I'm effectively uh, side effecting my superclass when I try and write this thing here. Right? So this guy is, uh, is the guy that's actually on the variable, you know, my list of variable stacks. Uh, I'm going to call this an activation record. Um, yeah. uh, but this is the prototype of the prototype of that guy. So I don't want to write it here. Where I actually want to write it is there. In order to discover that I should write it there, I have to look here and find that. But what this is, is an overriding assignment. Yeah? I'm going to override my superclass with this thing. OK? Um, I, can, I can make up new objects on the fly. This thing is just a literal object notation. It says, give me an object, a new object, with a field x and 1. Um, no superclass at that stage? No prototype? Right. Good question. And the answer is yes, there is, a, there is a prototype. The prototype of every object, by default, at the point of creation, is going to be the mother of all objects. So now would be a good time for me to tell you what these two pointers up here mean. All right? 
This stands for the location of object.prototype. Okay? Often in a web browser, you'll find that there's a variable somewhere in the store called object, which points to an object that has a variable in it somewhere called prototype, which in turn points to this. But those are both writable fields, so we can't rely on it. So on slides, I'm going to refer to it as lop. All right? But it is special. The semantics know where it is the whole time. And you can discover lop by creating a new object and the thing that the prototype of the new object points to. It's this one, right? Anytime you create a new object, you'll get a prototype pointer to there. The other thing that's special is LG. This is the global object. Again, often in your browser, you'll have a variable somewhere called window, which will point to this object. But that's writable. We can't rely on it. I'm going to use this notation. It is special because if I can't find a variable somewhere, that's where it's going to go. All right? Regardless of the value of the window variable. All right? Okay. So this is how you do a few things. Wait, so when you created that little, that little new object, it, yep. it's prototype with the mother of all objects. It's prototype pointing to this one, which I described as the mother of all objects. So how did there's a three and one? They didn't seem to have a prototype. How did you create them? Great. Those, those were created as the result of a function call. All right, so those were not created by a programmer asking for an object. Those were created by the programmer calling a function, and then a side effect of calling that function was to put an activation record on the end of this list, a brand new one, and that's pretending to be my local variables. So those are the only two kinds of objects that can lack prototypes. If you follow the specification by, to the letter, right, the specification of JavaScript, then yes, the only time you're ever going to have not a prototype is going to be if you're this object or if you're one of these activation records. But nobody does. All right? So if you follow that specification to the letter, then these red arrows are hidden. Okay? They're, they're as part of the semantics of the language, but they're not fields that I can grab, that I can get access to. Okay? I can't grab them and do assignments on them. Not in the spec. In the browser, I can. All the browsers, just, they just expose these things for you. And they usually expose them with a name like underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. Okay? So in practice, we can't rely on pretty well anything about these chains. People can assign numbers to these things or strings. You know. Okay. Can an object make itself its own prototype? No. The one thing that all of the browsers do agree on is that you shouldn't have cycles in these things. So what they usually do is if you attempt to create a cycle, at the moment that you perform the assignment that would have created in a cycle, they throw an exception and refuse to do it. So does that mean they do a strongly connected conversion analysis on the object graph every time you do an assignment? It means that every time you do an assignment to that particular field, they follow the chain of pointers until they get to null and check each time if, if you've just created a cycle. So they do a comparison with the object that you started with. So, yeah, you're traversing a linked list every time you do an assignment to Proto. In practice, right. In the spec, that's not because you can't do it, right? Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly show you uh, if you've got you know, two, vari uh, two variables in one expression. I've got to look all the way up this thing for x gets 5, and then I've got to look all the way up. Uh, I've got to look for the x, and I've got to spend some time looking for the y as well. And notice that I have to follow these pointers for both, right? So for those people in the audience who like separation logic, at this point they might start squicking. You know, it's, it's not nice. Even this very simple thing, I can't break down the left and the right with a star. Okay? So I might say more about that later. Okay. I'm going to introduce some notation. Uh, this object here, I'm going to write... In a formula, I'm going to write things a little bit like this. I've got an object which is pointed to by L. That's this bit. And on the left of the bar in here, I'm going to write all the variables that I know are not in that object. I really care about that. I have to. I have to have a, say, a way of saying this variable, this field is not a member of an object. Otherwise, I can't understand the variable store. Um, and on the right of the bar, I'm going to write all of the variables that are in the object, and I know what their values are. Okay? 
So. Wait, what about Z? Surely that's not an object neither. Z, in this formula, I am simply not telling you anything about. This formula tells you x is definitely not there, y definitely is there, and it says nothing about z. That means that if I'm thinking in terms of separation logic, later on I can frame on a reference to z, and then I'm good. But I can never frame on a reference to x here. Okay? So that's a thing that I can do. Um, a very similar notation, sometimes, in fact quite a lot of the time, I don't want to worry about all the horrible details inside this blue box. I just want to say there's something that looks like a variable store. And it makes use of, the, uh, of this list, all of these objects. There's something pointed to by that list that looks like a variable store. And again, on the left of the bar, the, I'm going to write variables that I know are not in the store. On the right of the bar, variables that I know are in the store. And what result I would get if I attempted to read them. Observably, what does that variable look like in the store? So that's a notation I can use. Given that notation, I can write this triple. And that's a whole lot nicer than all the mucking about about following pointers in the store, right? If, uh, if I want to do x gets y, I just, I need to have x, I need to have y, and I can, I can give it the, the value. The proof of this well, there's one third of the proof of this triple. So that, there we go. One third of it, that, that's one third of it. That, so that's a bit of a pain, but you know, I've done it so you don't have to. So long as you write programs which don't break the, um, the abstraction that we have a sensible variable store, you'll be able to prove them just using this kind of thing. But some programs do break that abstraction. And if you do want to break that abstraction and you want to do things like get a pointer to an object that you're also using in the variable store and mess with it by hand, well, then you're going to need to use more complicated formula to reason about it. Yeah? What's the true for? Right. This star true just means I may have generated some garbage in the process of doing this assignment. Okay? And the reason for that is because when I do an overriding assignment in this variable store, I may render some stuff um, more, it may not be unreachable from the point of view of the garbage collector, but it may be unreachable from the point of view of this as a variable store. If I've got a with statement in there, and I've suddenly started shadowing one of the variables in the with statement, then that's now separate from the store, and I can start messing with it in another way. Okay? So that's what's going on there. Okay. So here's a little example. Um, I promise you that by now I've told you everything you need to know to answer the question on this slide. When, so you've come across this code, maybe in the middle of some app that you're looking at, and you want to understand what does it do. When this code runs, what is the result of this function call? Does anyone want to guess? OK, so I've got, a, I've got a cry for one. I'm going to put one here. No, no. <laughs> Anyone else? Two. I'll stick with one. Two. Okay. I two. There's a one and there's a two? <laughs> Beautiful. Anything else? Okay, let's, let, 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 let's try it, all right? Um, so here it is. Here's my web browser, and, and I've written the code in there. And this is a simple page that just evals whatever's in this box and puts the result in that box. Okay? So, so I can click the Run button, and we got one. Whoever got one, congratulations. Oh, that's fine. I can put the null in. And I can click Run again, and you'll still get one. Okay? All right, good. <laughs> this code, uh, I've tested it on Firefox and Chrome and Safari, and it, and it worked on all of those, okay, for that particular thing. All right, so I'm going to move on. Is this a good specification for the code, right? We just did a test. We just tried, you know, um, to run this code, and what we got was that the return value at the end there was, was 1. 
Um, so is it the case that if I ever run this in a store where I have A and F, but I don't know what they are, who cares? I'm going to overwrite them anyway. Um, and when I'm done, I'll have a store with A and F, and I probably won't care what they are, and the return value will be 1. Can we prove this? Of course we can't prove this. The problem is, what if some other guy came along and did this first? All right? So, so let's see what happens if some other guy comes along and does that first. I'm going to run this, and what I get, the result of calling f is the string. Didn't the, we ever write it? Sorry? Didn't we ever write it without assignment to f? That's a good question. So let's, let's walk through what happens with, with this code, right? That's why I've got the chart here. OK. So first of all, just without the evil code at the top, right? I'm just going to do the a, x gets 1, the with, and the call, and that kind of stuff, all right? So, so here's a variable store. And I'm going to do a, x gets 1. I'm going to create a new object, because there's my literal object. And here's the x gets 1. And that literal object has a pointer up to this guy, right? A prototype pointer there. And now I'm going to, uh, and, and I've, I've done the assignment, right? So I'm going to put the A, it's global, remember? Yeah. That points to this guy. Um, and then I'm going to do the with A. So I guess I'd better, I'd better put my 1, 2, 3, and 4 on here. And I'd better show you that my variable store is currently being represented by the pointers 1, 2, 3, and 4. But as soon as I go into the with block, let's say that this thing was 5. As soon as I go into the with block, I'm going to put 5 on the front of that. Okay? Because that's what the, that's what the with block does. Right? I did with A, so I look at A, I follow A, I find 5. So I'm going to execute the body just with 5 on the front. Okay? So now I'm going to execute the body. I'm going to do f equals function y. Well, function y return x. That's just like a literal object. All right? Functions are just objects in JavaScript. So I'm going to create a new function object there. And it's got a body, and the body is there. And it's also got a closure. And that closure is just a copy of this list. OK? So I'm just going to write 5, 1, 2, 3, 4 there. All right, uh, And this was an assignment to f. I couldn't find f anywhere in here, so I put it in the global object. And that's going to be a pointer to this guy. Now I come out of the with block. right? So I've just got, I've just got to this curly brace here. I'm going to come out of the with block. And as I come out of the with block, I get rid of that 5 on the front there. Now I do a new assignment. A gives me... Uh, a new object. I'm just going to create my new object there, and that has x2 in it. And I break this, and that now points there. And then I try and I call the f, and when I go to run the body of the f, which says return x, I return x, and my first local variable is the 5 block, so I get the 1, right? That's what should happen. But what happens if some other guy came along and did this code first? If they did object.prototype.f. So here's the object.prototype. I'll put an f here. And that guy is going to point to the evil code, right? That's the evil code. I do the with again. So I'm going to put this guy on the front of my, um, of my stack. Now I want to do an assignment. f becomes equal to some function. So the key is, I've created my f. I want to find where I should write the variable to. I look here. f's not there. I follow the prototype. Oh, f is here. So this is a local assignment. So what I get is my good f is in this block now. It's not this one. This never got created. I come out of the with block. I get rid of the 5 there. I create this thing, which we don't care about. And then I try and call the f. I look here. There's no f. No f. No f. No f. There's an f. 
It's evil. Did everybody follow that? Okay. This is an example of a thing called a prototype poisoning attack. Um, it happens, right? This is a good way to steal confidential data. If you've got a piece of code, you know, I just passed null into this. Um, I just passed null into this guy, but I could have been passing something sensitive, right? And if I knew it was my code, then that's okay, because my code knows how to deal with sensitive data. But if it might be someone else's, they might just email it. Yes. Would you regard this as a flaw in the language? I mean, had, had they foreseen this, would it have been readily fixed? Or is it somehow an, an ineluctable consequence of doing prototype-based programming? I don't think it's a consequence necessarily of prototype-based programming. I think it's a consequence of the particular combination of prototype and functional programming that you get in JavaScript. I think you can build a very nice uh, sub-language of JavaScript which, is, which feels very object or prototype oriented. And you can write in that language, and so long as you only interact with code that is also written in that language, everything is nice. <laughs> Similarly, you can pick a very nice functional subset of JavaScript. Some people are, like to say that JavaScript is the world's most widely deployed functional programming language. Um, you can write beautiful functional code in JavaScript. And so long as you only ever interact with functionally written code, everything's fine. The problem is when the two come together, and the particular ways that they've been implemented in each case don't necessarily get on very well. This is the kind of thing you get. So it's not actually readily avoidable, not just a simple flaw. One thing you can do is you can ban with. Oh. All right? Yeah. If you look at ECMAScript 5, the latest specification of the language, there's a strict mode which is designed to make people like us happy, right? And it bans with. In strict mode, you can't use it. Which begs the question, why am I bothering with it? You know, if they're starting to ban it anyway, why do I care? I don't think with is going to go away completely. Because even though it's possible to write nice, strict code without, without with, right, where it's banned, um, if you look at things like Google Kaha, which provides you with a sandbox for an even stricter subset, which the Google guys call SES, Secure ECMAScript, in order to implement that sandbox, they need to write non-strict code. And that non-strict code which implements their sandbox uses with. It's powerful and useful. You know, it, is, it, it gives you a good way of locking an environment around code that you don't trust. There's no, I guess, sort of intuitively, you'd like to kind of, you know, maybe not you can actually find a sort, of, a sort of actual language subset which is sensible, but you might be able to find a sort of logical, functional subset which has sensible behavior. And it seems, it seems like what you're saying is there's no way of kind of categorizing the kind of good and bad behaviors sort of uh, on the face of it. You know, to me, this kind of prototype poisoning attack, that doesn't look like kind of, that doesn't look like sort of, sort of a, an attack. It just looks like a fault. It just looks yeah, like exactly. A it's a problem with this program. So in fact, what we should have written for our precondition for the program is this, which is exactly what I wrote before, except that now I'm demanding that I know beforehand that this F not be in the prototype there, right? Um, in fact, one of the projects I'm working on, um, which is nowhere near ready yet, I'm working on it with a, with a master's student at, at Imperial, is a way of taking preconditions like this, which you can imagine might have been generated by a tool, and using them to generate code, which we can compose with this code to harden it. So if this code tries to run in a state where this isn't true, it will fail gracefully. No, no, that, that's not always the case at all. It's the case at the moment because we did this funny thing with with, right? But a lot of, you know, if a lot of the time I might not care about whether the prototype contains a copy of the variable I'm working or not. That's fine. It's just for this program it's important. Okay. So we, we've got a way of doing that there. Um, I should point out, okay, separation logic people um, may be happy with the star down here, but probably haven't seen this thing. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it, 
But what this is, is it's like a star, except there may be some sharing. Okay? It's not and. It doesn't mean that this must be exactly the same footprint as this. Nor is it star, Q, and true. Um, it, um, no, nor is it and Q star true. Because the footprint of the whole thing is bounded by the union of the footprints of the two of them. It's <coughs> these guys may be separate and they may share a bit and it's okay. Right? So I'm saying somewhere in this variable store there's probably going to be this prototype and I want to make sure that these properties hold of it. Okay. I've talked a bit about JavaScript. Um, for, for nice programs, we can write nice specifications. We can still prove a lot of very weird programs. If you're willing to break into that store abstraction I talked about and just deal with the individual objects, that's great. We do have a prototype automatic tool. Um, in fact, the example I just gave you, we can give it to this tool without any annotations, and the tool will give us a specification, a true specification for that program. It is a slightly more complicated specification than the one I showed you because our tool doesn't cope nicely with that new connective I showed you. But it's not bad. I'm, I'm here all day, so if you're interested in the tool, I can talk to you about that later. Um, it's primarily by another student at Imperial, uh, Diver Nogginiene. Um, okay, I'm going to move on now, and I'm going to talk a bit more about DOM. So like I said before, DOM is a library for messing with XML, and we're going to use it in JavaScript programs as if it were a UI library. Yeah? Just to explain how one exploits the prototype facilities. For example, can you backtrack? Backtrack in what context? Well, just undo the last three things that you did. Can I undo the last three things that I, I did? Give me a, how do I exploit the fact that all what, what is the point of having set up for me? What is the point of having prototypes? Is that yes. what you're asking? Yes. OK. If I want to do um, a standard object-oriented programming trick, right? I want to have um, uh, some objects. Uh, I want to have some code which I can run on any object which I consider to be an item of clothing. And I want to have some other code which I can run on any object which I consider to be a jacket. Yeah? So jacket is a subclass of clothes, right? So I, do, I use inheritance. I might have put on in the item of clothing, right? And I might have, you know, jacket-specific methods. In, um, in, my, in my representation, I'm going to have... It, in Java, I would have a class for clothes and a class for jackets, and I would have objects of type jacket. In JavaScript, I don't have classes. There's no, there's no type system, so I can't. So what I have is an object which represents stuff I want to do to clothes and an object that represents stuff I want to do to jackets. The prototype of the object that represents the stuff I want to do to jackets is the stuff I want to do to clothes. So it inherits those methods automatically. And then I can have an object that represents a particular jacket and its prototype is going to be the object that represents jackets in general. And it's going to contain data that's specific to the jacket in question. Does that help? I think so. Thank you. OK. <coughs> I'm going to move on to DOM. <coughs> XML, trees, UIs. OK. I've been showing you diagrams that look like this. Hopefully, it's fairly obvious that I can look at these objects in boxes like this. Right? These are the memory addresses of the objects. And here are lists of fields and their values that hang off the things. All happy with that? Cool. So we could think about DOM like this. right? We could think about DOM as being objects in the heap. Here's, here's a node, and it's got a list of children. And the first child in that list is this one, and the last child in that list is this one, and so on. Uh, we could do that, but we really shouldn't. Okay. Um, one of the reasons we shouldn't is because this way of thinking about DOM, just as if it were JavaScript, implies that DOM should always be implemented in JavaScript. And it's not. In your web browser, the, uh, the DOM nodes that you look at are going to present sometimes as if they were a little bit like JavaScript objects. But there's a lot of stuff that they can do that JavaScript cannot. 
for a start, it can mess with your screen, right? That's why we have the DOM in the first place. It, it's what the user sees. So it's not just JavaScript. But also, just isn't that nicer, right? We, we want trees to be trees, okay? I can think about them as trees. I can look at them. They look like trees. Okay, so I want, I want the trees in my model to look and feel like them. So I'm going to have... I'm going to have a special address top, which is going to sit in my, um, in my address space, right? I can have other JavaScript objects hanging off the address space just fine. But this is the address of the tree. And when the web browser wants to know what to show the user, because it's refreshing the screen, it's going to look at the tree here and render it, OK? Um, so I'm going to call this a structured heap, right? This was an object heap. This is a structured heap. It's got more complicated structure in it. OK. Now, I've got to say a little bit more about separating star for those people who put up their hands and didn't really know what it, how it works, OK? Separating star means I've got this bit of the heap, and it's separate from this bit of the heap. I know that this is true of this bit. I know that this is true of the other bit. And I know that they don't touch each other. That's what separating star means. When you've got an object heap, the great thing about the star is you can chop the object heap up any way you want. You can flick them around. You can put them back together again. It doesn't matter. No one cares what order the addresses come in in an object heap unless you have pointer arithmetic, which in JavaScript you don't. OK? So we don't, we don't care what, you know, what the names of these addresses are. With trees, it's not so nice. If I were to chop this tree up like this, and I try and put them back together again, I end up with a tree that's different from what I started with. Or I might have, you know, I don't know how to put these things back together. It could go anywhere. So the solution to this problem is when I chop out this node, I'm going to leave a hole in its place. I'm going to create a logical address. And that logical address I'm going to think of as living in my address space except that it's blue and Greek. That means that the program can't mess with it. The program doesn't know about this. This has nothing to do with the semantics of the programming language. This is just for the logical reasoning. It's just to make it easy for me to consider the idea of chopping this tree up and just thinking about this little bit separately from this other bit. So in my reasoning, I can do something that we might term um, abstract allocation where I allocate a new address and I make use of it. Or similarly, I can do deallocation, where I go that way. They're really just implications, but you can think of them as allocation and deallocation in your reasoning, if it makes life easier. OK. Um, here's the notation I'm going to use for this kind of stuff. So I've got a tree at the top, and it looks like an HTML node with address 1. Uh, HTML is the name of the node. There it is. And it's got some children. And those children are, well, whatever is in this hole, the alpha hole. I don't know what's there. Whatever's there, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> and next to that, we've got another node, which is called body, address 3, and no children. And separately from this stuff, separately from that, I also know that I've got this alpha thing, and it contains a tree node with head and address two and no children. And then later on, I can compress these back together. Yes, and I'm curious, so what makes it specific to the trees? Can you apply that to the JavaScript uh, this, con the, the, this idea of the, um, the alpha. Yes. Um, there wouldn't be a lot of point, because the JavaScript heap, uh, the objects in it uh, are so small. They don't, they don't contain each other in the way that uh, trees contain each other. There is, you know, there's a potentially enormous tree under this thing with very important structure to it, right? Whereas in the DOM, uh, where, whereas in, in the object heap, it's just, it's just things like this, right? I'm, I never have anything very big dangling off here. I may have an object here which contains a pointer, but that pointer is just a value. You know, it points to one of these guys. Yeah, I don't have big structure down here. So since this, these alphas kind of, kind of flatten the structure, goes back 
to your other picture. You could flatten it everywhere, and then you'd be back. <coughs> yeah, and then you're back to the problem of you you can't see the structure of the tree anymore. When you say when you talk about when this is a computer, we're talking about doing this reasoning ultimately. I would like to be able to do this reasoning on paper as well. Okay, so this is a kind of notational convenience that lets you compress out used once pointers, as it were. If you like. Okay. That, 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 that's, not a, that's not such a bad way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so we've got all this. This idea of, um, of abstract allocation and deallocation, if you want to know more about that, you can read Adam Wright's thesis. His name was on the front as well. Um, okay. Oh, and, and I've taken you through all of this. Right. Um, yes. So, if you're happy with separation logic, well, even if you're not, if... If I know that these guys are separate, and if I want to mess with this guy with some program, then so long as my program only messes with this guy, I don't have to worry about this one. I can temporarily forget it and call it back later. And separation logic people call this the frame rule. So I'm going to frame that off, and I'm just going to be left with this one. Okay? And now I'm going to talk about some DOM programs. So here's an axiom for get node name. And hopefully that's fairly obvious, right? I need to know, if I'm going to get the node name with DOM address n, I need to know that I have a node with DOM address n. And I've made use of this abstract allocation to make sure that I can grab it directly. Right? I don't have to traverse a whole tree to find it. So I've got this thing with address n, and I want to get its name, so when I'm done, the return value is the name. Dead simple. All right? Now let's add some JavaScript. Okay? So we can't write literal DOM addresses. So in JavaScript, we have to make use of a variable. I'm going to do x.getNodeName. x is a JavaScript variable in my store, which is separate from the tree. Um, the value of that variable is the DOM address. So I'm good. When I'm done, I can give you the, uh, I can give you the name. Simple. Here's, here's the same thing, but writing the name. I need to know that I'm going to x.setNodeName name, name, so I need to know that x is a variable corresponding to the address of a DOM thing, and that the name that I want to write to it is actually a name that can be written. Obviously, in JavaScript, you know, this could be a string, it could be a number, it could be a pointer. I want it to be a string in this case, otherwise this won't make sense. And when I'm done, well, I'll have the new name up there, and I'm good. OK, so here's a simple program. What this program does is it gets the name of a node. And if the name of that node is a name that I don't like, then I'm going to set the new name of the node to be Bruce to avoid confusion. So we can specify this program. There we go. And I've put the DOM bits in blue. So I need to know before I start that I've got some variable store and no one else has messed with the variable name before because I'm going to need that. I need to know that I've got a node and that it corresponds to that the address of the node that I've got corresponds to a real node that I've got my hands on. I need to be sure that I have a blacklist. There's the address of the blacklist. Here's the blacklist. I'm just saying that I like the names Fred, Wilmer, and Bruce, and I don't like the names Pebbles and Bam Bam. That's just, that's just what I'm going to do. Um, when I'm done, I still have my node. There it is. I still have my blacklist. There it is. But the name of the node has changed. It's not name anymore. It's name prime. And I know for sure that name prime is not one of these things that I knew were in my blacklist. It's not Pebbles or Bam Bam. OK? So I can write this program. Hopefully you can see it's not going to be hard to prove this program, right? The, um, you know, the intermediate conditions, this is, just, uh, this is just an instance of the axiom I just gave you. This is just I get the thing. <coughs> you know, I've, I've shown you all of these things before. All right? This is going to be easy to prove. So this seems kind of frivolous. Why would I want to do that? Um, so far, I've just told you about... Um, just for notational convenience, I've talked about DOM nodes that have names and children. Of course, real DOM nodes also have attributes and things like that. 
If we think about this program, and instead of thinking about getting the name, we get the source attribute of an image link, then this begins to look a little bit like an ad blocker, a little bit like the core of an ad blocker, right? So here's a simple ad blocker. I've got some blacklist of bad URLs. These are images that I know to be adverts. Here's the function that I just, I just showed you, right? There's the body of the function. I just get, you know, for, for whatever this image is, I'm going to get the source attribute of that image. So now I've got the URL of the, uh, of the image. And if it's in the blacklist, I'm going to change that image to not be that one anymore. Instead, it's going to be a nice kitten. And then I'm going to get all the images in my documents. I'm going to iterate over them, and I'm going to run this thing on all of them. So then, by the end, I'm going to know that there are no bad images in the document. So here's the spec. That's probably far too small to read, so let's zoom in on the specifications. So this is, this is pretty easy. Up at the start, I just need to know that I've got a blacklist. It contains all the bad URLs that have been reported to be adverts. I've got some... HTML document, there it is, and I don't know anything about the children of this document. When I'm done, I've still got my blacklist, there it is, and I've still got my document, but now I know more about the children. This is one of the reasons that we want real trees in our logic and not just objects, because if we have real trees, it's really easy to write modalities like everywhere. So I'm just going to tell you what this means. This means that at every point in the tree, no matter how far down or which branch you go down, the following formula is going to have to be true. Okay? It would if I wrote this formula to allow for alphas, but I didn't. Um, this true means that there aren't any alphas. I've got all of it. OK? Uh, so yes, things get complicated if, by the time you come to prove this, you haven't collapsed back again. But if I watch it, if I watch it, instead of uh, one of these fields. Uh, instead of one of these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, inside the box, I said alpha. And could I put star, oh, it should be beta here. Sorry, there's an alpha already, beta. And then beta with some similar formula. Uh, you could write that, and you may get some unexpected meanings as a result. Okay? There's no straightforward way to get this meaning. Uh, this meaning with betas in here. What you would need is... Um, so, what this is doing, right? If you think about this in a separation logic way, this is saying, I've got my hands on the whole tree under here, and this is an invariant <laughs> about it, right? If you put a beta in there, then what you're saying is, well, I've got my hands on most of it, but I've given some of it up. Some of it, you know, it belongs to that other guy over there on the other side of the star. So if you do that, then of course you can't say what this other guy is doing, right? It's this other guy. I can say, I can give you an invariant about the stuff that I've got. If I choose to give it up, it's not my problem anymore, okay? That, that's the way this stuff works. So what this says is our invariant is going to be anywhere that you can find an image, it had better be the case that if that image has uh, a source URL, then that source URL is not one of the bad ones. And it might have some children. That's fine. OK? So that's our specification of this little ad blocker. All right. So we can do, we want to do abstract tree reasoning for an abstract library. It's a cross-platform library. It's not specifically for JavaScript. There are implementations for Java, for Python, for C, for, for Haskell even. Um, there are implementations for all of these things. This, re this DOM reasoning will work for all of them. It fits very nicely with the reasoning we've got for JavaScript. So we can do them both at the same time. We can separate trees using star. We don't have to use a brand new logic. Previously, we thought maybe we'd have to invent a thing called context logic for this, right? Now it turns out we can use separation logic. We can make use of all the lovely separation logic results that the separation logic people give us. And there is a very early prototype of the automation for this thing by Adam Wright. And what that does is it makes use of Verifast, if you know that. Okay. 
um, and, and they get on. I promised earlier I would say a little bit about the big project. So this is it, all right? Um, I've, in this talk, I've talked about this box and this box, and I've hinted at the existence of this box. And I can tell you more about that offline if you like. These things up at the top are my wish list for things I want to exist in the universe. I want to be able to compile high-level languages to JavaScript with confidence. I want to be able to have good IDE support. I want to make up some good specialized tools. Down at the bottom here, these are things that do exist in the world. Right? We've got documents that say what web browsers should do. And of course, the web browsers don't do quite what those documents say. So we've got the browsers themselves. Um, we've got an ongoing project to formalize the semantics of these documents in Coq, generate a correct implementation. Right? This bit we've largely got. That, that's almost done now for ES5. We can and have generated a correct implementation of this. What we want to do is test this implementation against the actual behaviors and then iterate this loop so that we can start adding parameters to this. Say, when you want to behave like Firefox, this is what you do. Okay? So then when we're done, we'll have a good idea of how browsers actually behave. We've got this program logic, which I've just talked about. We want to put that in cock. We want to prove it against this. Once we've done that, then if I give you a proof in my logic, you better believe that it actually works in the browser. Right? That's the confidence I want to give you. The tools I've told you about, obviously we don't want to build a tool in cock. I say this obviously. Someone actually just told me that I probably should. Um, but but I hard. I want to be able to do all the gnarly things I like to do when I'm writing tools in ML. Um, but I do want my tool to generate a script that Cock can check. If my tool thinks it's found a proof, maybe it's a good proof, maybe it's a bug in my tool. But if you can check that proof in Cock, well, then we're good. All right, that's what I want this to do. Um, and on top of all of this, I want to be able to build these things. I just showed you a thing that looked a little bit like an add-on for... Um, for an ad blocker. In fact, it was a Grease Monkey script, very similar. It, I can show you it running if you like. Um, there are people whose jobs it is to sit at the companies that provide systems that allow add ons, okay? Uh, Mozilla Firefox, Windows 8, um, all the web browsers, all of these things. They invite people to submit add ons to their system, and then we have something like a store, like an app store. And there's someone whose job it is, every time something is submitted, to look at this JavaScript code and decide whether or not it is evil. This is hard, hard and boring. Wouldn't it be great if we could provide a tool which, given a piece of JavaScript code, gives you a diagram of this is all the stuff that this code is going to mess with. In DOM, that's particularly helpful because DOM is a very visual thing anyway. You know, it's a tree that we're used to looking at on our screens. And separation logic is very good for this kind of thing. Separation logic tools in, uh, in other areas for reasoning about C and so on <laughs> have shown that they can be very good at finding the shapes of memory that a program is going to mess with. So that's what we'd like to provide. At some point, you know, once we've got all this kit working, we would like to provide tools which give me a piece of code, this is what it'll mess with. And you can look visually and see, will it, Try and access all my passwords. If so, maybe I should look a little bit harder at it. That's one example of the tools I'd like to provide. OK, I think I'm about out of time. So I guess um, your logic's obviously quite complicated. Yes, it is. There are times when you can get quite nice listy things out of it. So if you look at Daivano Giniene's work, one of the things she's done is this store predicate that I showed you, right? When I gave you the complicated example, I immediately had to break into that store predicate and use the sepish and say, well, I've done something unusual, so now I have to deal with all the gnarly sharing. Yeah? 
And that's exactly the problem that you want to avoid, right? That's the thing that tools are not good at. But we do have a tool that can prove that program. And the way that that worked was rather than using the store predicate, we came up with a slightly more clever predicate, which, while it's not quite as nice to look at as the store one, it gives you a little bit more power in terms of the gnarliness of the things that you can do. So we chop up the variable store in a slightly different way. And we just use separation. And each of the distinct boxes that we chop the variable store into, they behave quite a lot like linked lists. And then we can make use of all the, all the usual linked list kit that we know how to do. And we can get something out of it. So it's true that, like in the general case, you know, if people give us really gnarly code, sometimes we're just going to have to say, sorry, I don't know. But a lot of the time, programmers aren't writing thinking about gnarly code. Attackers might do. But the programmers that write the code that we want to verify, usually they've got a fairly simple model in their heads of what's going on. We've got to make sure that the model in their heads is sound. You know, if, if their model doesn't correspond with the semantics of the language, we're in trouble. That's why we need the gnarly logic, right? But we should be able to provide abstractions that reflect the intuition in the head of the programmer. And then we can take on the pain, prove that abstraction works under certain circumstances in the whole logic, and then allow the automatic tool to make use of, the, uh, of that abstraction and reason at the same level that the programmer is reasoning, right up until the point where it stops working, and then we throw up our hands and say, I don't know. Does that help? Selects elites of people. yes, and then there's a kind of there's a sort of sub language which has you know lots of nice clean properties. So is there is it is it fair to say that these kind of the abstract predicates, the store predicates, and the other ones like that, that's the kind of you know you're kind of some dude sat in a kind of cubicle somewhere in Mozilla, you work on that, and then the other stuff is for kind of uh, yes, you know, with a qualification, okay, and the qualification is that. Ordinarily, it's safe to think about sublanguages on your own and just say, well, just program in the sublanguage and you're fine because you have control over your module of the program and no one else can mess with it. It's your module. Most programming languages provide some kind of modularity mechanisms like that. Not, not C. Okay, not C. Fair yeah, enough. I mean, it's a classic application of separation Yeah. where you have no protection at all. Right? Okay, great. In which case, yes, if that's the sort of thing that you're thinking of, then, yeah, that's, that's very much the kind of thing we're thinking. Yeah. Thank you very much.